welcome everybody, welcome. Um, if you would all like to stand, we're going to begin a time of worship when the instruments can be heard as well. That would be fun. Um, ooh. <laughs> uh, lovely. I'm going to just start with a small little verse uh, from Psalm 24. Um, yeah. Uh, lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? The King of glory. He is the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Um, uh, Lord, I just pray that as we come into a time of worship, that we have our hands free, Lord. Free of burdens, free of stress, uh, free of anxiety. Uh, Lord, that we leave them free for you. We leave them free for you to enter into our time of worship, uh, enter into praise. Uh, that we enter it with a heart of thanksgiving and joy, Lord. Um, because you are the Lord Almighty, you are the King of glory. Um, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
When everything around me is shaking I'm never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I would
thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking with the sand. And, and you can pray for this morning that Christ is our firm foundation. Whatever season, whatever circumstance, whatever it is that surrounds us, there's one who upholds us, one who strengthens us, there's one who keeps us safe, one who keeps us secure. And Brenda, just in that worship time, just felt she had a picture from the Lord that's particularly pertinent for some people in the room. So I'm going to ask Brenda to share that. Thank you, Danny. I saw a picture of a very thin, narrow road bridge crossing from one mountain to another and there was a huge chasm and this road bridge if you went near it it just started swaying and moving and I feel God is saying that there are some of us here today that we are right there and the only way forward is to go across this road bridge but it is absolutely terrifying you dare, if you put your foot on it it starts shaking and you pull back. But I feel God is saying to us today, you are safe with me. I will never let you down. And God is saying, take those steps and start crossing because God wants you to know he will take you across. And his word to you today is, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for I am your God and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brenda. Let's just take a moment to lift our hands to heaven. We're going to pray into that right now. But Father, we pray in Jesus' name that any fear, any anxiety that any of us might be possessing this morning would dissipate and disappear in Jesus' name. Because you're a God of love and perfect love casts out all fear. For those who feel paralyzed like Brenda's just spoken of, those who feel they can't take that next step forward because of the uncertainty of what may lie ahead, I pray, Lord, for a divine reassurance in our lives whereby we know that our God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. The one who never leaves us, the one who never forsakes us. I pray that that revelation would not just reside in our heads, but it would drop down deep into our hearts and bring freedom from fear. In Jesus' name, we pray that confidence and hope and faith would rise in our lives as we see who you really are and we see the potential of what you can bring us through. In Jesus' name. Father God, right now we pray in a world that is shaken that you would bring some stability to situations that we see unfolding even right now. We pray for the nation of Israel this morning. That land that is so precious to you, those people who are so precious to you. We pray in Jesus' name for the atrocities that have been unfolding in recent days that the Prince of Peace would rule and reign in that place in Jesus' name for hurting families that are suffering loss right now, for the divides and the divisions that are causing so much damage and so much pain as what seems to be a considerable conflict starts to arise. We pray in your sovereignty, you would establish peace, 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 peace in that shaken land today, we pray. We thank you that Christ is our firm foundation. Jesus Christ, reveal yourself to hearts and lives in that nation and in that region today, we pray. In Jesus' precious and powerful name. All God's people said. All God's people said. Amen. 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 It's good to see you this morning. Uh, if you're new here, my name's Danny. I'm the pastor here along with my wife, Naomi, we lead the church together. If you're watching online at home, you're also welcome. But it's now time uh, early on in our service to send our brilliant Life Kids to their program. So if you've signed in for Life Kids on your way out, follow someone in a yellow t-shirt or someone who's waving a big giant hand around the room and uh, they'll show you where you're meant to go for your brilliant program. Whilst our kids are leaving, why don't we turn around and just say hello to a few people, give someone a squeeze, make someone feel at home.
Fantastic, once you've said hello to a few unfamiliar faces, perhaps grab a seat. We're going to pray for a few people this morning, uh, just before we move on in our time of worship. But uh, we believe that this church, that that marriage is a divine institution. It's not just a man-made idea, but there's something precious, there's something sacred, there's something holy about marriage. And uh, just yesterday, in fact, I think this is worth mentioning, we were able to celebrate with Keith and Rachel over there, who are celebrating 54 years of being married, which absolutely deserves a huge round of applause. Such a joy to join with them yesterday afternoon. and. Uh, we want more stories like that, don't we? Of love that has stood the test of time. Love that hasn't failed in the way that 1 Corinthians 13 describes. And uh, this morning it's our joy to just pray for a special couple who are getting married uh, in just two Saturdays' time. So I'm going to invite Stephen and Emily, soon to be Salalila, to come and join me up on the platform. Give these guys a round of applause. And we'll pray for them. And we're also just going to take a moment to pray for a few people that are going out on mission uh, this week. Aren't you grateful to be part of a church that is not just touching and transforming things here in Bedworth, Bedworth but we're involved in things right across the face of the earth. And we've got three of our guys going out to India on Thursday this week to join with our missions partner, Pastor John, over there. If you remember at Christmas time last year, we took up an offering towards uh, the purchase of a medical aid van to make a difference in rural communities in southern India, but ultimately to be a vehicle that brings the good news of Jesus to communities as well. And uh, Adrian and Graham and Jamie are going out later this week for the official or inauguration of that van, I got that right, the inauguration of that van, and just to encourage and support and bless our partners out there. So Adrian, Graham, and Jamie, come and join me on the platform as well. We're going to pray for these guys before they go out. Give these mighty men of God a round of applause as they come up. Are you, are you getting married to these guys as well, Jamie? You come and stand on this side. You come and stand on this side. So in, in just a few seconds, Stephen or Emily, tell us a little bit about your hopes and dreams for married life and what you want us to pray into. And I'm going to ask Adrian if you can just share a few thoughts, things that we can be praying for while you're gone in India as well. So give me a hand in order. Good morning, church. How are you doing? You guys all right? Lovely. Um, I have the privilege to um, marry to my soon-to-be wife, Emily. And it's absolutely an honor to do life with her the last two years and to finally um, we could tie the knot, let's say. And uh, we're getting married here in church, uh, our home. Uh, we've been here for the last two years and it's been such a privilege to be here in this community who's given us everything and um, supported us throughout, and, um, which is why we're doing it here. Uh, in our own, on home turf and uh, also to extend the invitation to everyone that wants to come uh, honestly it is um, just our hearts to do this with you guys really and to celebrate this um, yeah to, cel to do this celebration in front of God with you guys and we wouldn't have it any other way we've already invited the youth um, last Friday and we're so excited and yeah, um, our hearts is just to do this with you guys. And that's it. If you didn't catch that, you're invited to the wedding. We come Saturday, okay? You're welcome to come. I'm going to ask Ralph and James to come and stand with Stephen and Emily as we pray. And uh, as they just come up to the platform, Adrian, share a bit about what's going to be going on. Yeah, so we're going out for a, quite a lightning visit, sort of like a long weekend to India to uh, just... As Danny said, inaugurate the uh, the launch really of this medical mission. So we're going to be praying for for Pastor John and those that are going to be involved with that. Um, and I'm sure we'll be preaching in their church on Sunday. And they've got a children's home that we'll be visiting. And the thing is, when you go there, you get asked to do all kinds of things. So Jamie probably will be doing sign dances and all sorts with the kids. <laughs> so we, 
flexibility is the key. Um, just value your prayers that God would lead us and guide us and uh, just uh, really cement that partnership that we've established with, with Pastor John. It's incredible how God brings together hearts for his kingdom. You know, we met John the last time we visited his ministry in India was 21 years ago. Extraordinary. And yet God brings little connections like Graham, completely independent from me, not even part of the church at the time, met John at a conference, Keswick Convention, 10 years ago, whenever it was. And, and, and so Graham went out and visited the same ministry. It was actually baptized in India. Um, so just the heart connections that come together. So just we pray that something significant would be, already has been birthed, but will just grow for the glory of God, for the blessing of the people of India, that many would come to know Jesus. Fantastic. Why don't we stand together as we just pray for these two groups of people. Ralph, I'm going to ask you to pray for Stephen and Emily, if that's all right. Father, we thank you for this amazing couple. Father, but we recognize that it's not just two that are being united together, but it's three because you will be in the midst of their relationship and their marriage going forward. And God, we just pray every blessing upon them. Father, I pray that over the weeks, months, and years to come, that they will be more united with one another and more united with you. Father, I pray that their home will be a blessing, not just to people they know, but to, to neighbors as well, God, that people will recognize this is a couple who have you at the center of their marriage. Father, I pray your blessing upon them that everything that they do, everything that they were involved in will stem from their relationship with you. So pour your blessing into them. God, may this be a fantastic couple going forward in relation with their marriage and with their relation with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, right now we pray for these men of God going to serve you in India over this coming week. We pray, Lord, for traveling mercies. We pray for protection. We pray that you would take care of every detail practically. But more importantly, we pray for divine encounters on that journey in Jesus' name. We pray as they go to India, they will be a wonderful blessing and encouragement to Pastor John and the team there. Lord, we pray for salvation, Lord, as they go into communities sharing their testimony and preaching the good news of Jesus. Lord, we pray for lives to be changed and communities to be touched as a result of where you lead them and where you guide them on this trip. Lord, we pray for a strengthening of that partnership, of fostering, of friendship. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be with them, you would be upon them, you would work through them everywhere they go and everything they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give these guys a round of applause. We've got a little gift for Stephen and Emily as well. There you go, guys. Wonderful. Take your seats a minute. How many people know that next weekend is something of a significant weekend for us? It's yeah. our second expansion offering next Sunday morning and uh, if you remember last November when we had our first expansion offering it was a significant morning there was a touch of heaven on this place and we're believing for the same again yes because we're still committed to the expansion and the extension of our building here and uh, we're believing that God's going to move powerfully next Sunday so you need to be here but I also also want to encourage you to come prepared come ready to give come ready to to sow in to what we believe God is doing here. Jesus said this. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. How many people know that where your money goes reveals what your priorities are? And anytime your money leaves you, you feel something emotionally. That's why whenever the doorbell rings at our house and it's the delivery driver, I feel something in my heart. There's usually some pain that is caused because I know that something of my treasure is leaving me towards something that's not always a priority to me because it's usually something that she has purchased for herself. Don't give us sympathy. They believe me. Believe me. If anyone needs the awe, it's me. But the truth is this, money and our hearts are intertwined. Money and our hearts are, are inseparably connected. And I believe this, 
that next Sunday, this is what I don't want you to come with the posture of. I don't want you to come thinking, God, God needs my money. God doesn't need your money. He's doing all right. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He's all right. He doesn't need your money. But I believe there are times in which he wants something of our treasure. And he wants something of our wealth. Why? Because he wants our hearts. He wants our hearts. First Peter 2 says that we're to set Christ apart as Lord in our hearts. And if he's not Lord of all, including our wealth, then my suggestion is he's not Lord at all in our lives. And next Sunday, I want us to come collectively prepared to give. If your heart is for Life Church, if this is your home, if you're on board with the vision and the direction we are heading in, I want to encourage you. Let's all come prepared to give something of our treasure to that which has captured our hearts next Sunday. Can we do that collectively? Can we do that together? I hope you realize that you're now sat in a building that others paid the price for decades ago. They sacrificed, they sold, they gave when it was inconvenient, when it was uncomfortable, so that future generations could benefit from what they gave. And I believe this, that there are going to be generations after generation after generation of people in Bedworth and beyond, blessed as a result of what we see God establish in this place through his people. So I'm going to speak into that a little bit more next Sunday as we give. But can I encourage you, come ready to give. Not just spectate, but participate in what God is doing in this place next Sunday. Is that all right? With that in mind, we're going to stand right now. We're going to take our offering, not our expansion offering. That's, that's next Sunday. We're going to take our offering. And let's remember that what we give, what we sow, reveals whether God has truly got our hearts or not. So let's give generously as part of our worship right now. And let's enjoy God's presence together as we go back into a time of sun worship together.
It's incredible what God's calling us to as a family, as a church, to step into expansion. But the thing is, we need this Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that lives in us raised Christ from the dead. That same Spirit. (laughs) And the thing is, without Him, the building means nothing. And I believe He called us to the building. But I just feel a stirring that we just need to ask. And though He's so willing, 
and so ready to pour His Spirit out, that we just have hearts open and hearts ready to receive Him, that we just say, Lord, this is Your house. This is, have Your way in this place. So I just want to sing this chorus again, and let us just focus on the words and what, what it's really asking. It's not just a pretty song, but it's a prayer. We need the, a fresh wind. We need your Holy Spirit come, have your way, be glorified. This isn't about a building, this is about you being glorified. So we just worship you in this place, we praise you in this place. And we just ask God that you would just come, Holy Spirit, come in power. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. A holy anointing, the power of your presence. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Oh, we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, a holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. 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 Let all the redeemed prophesy.
worship you, God. Holy Spirit, we say you are welcome in this place. We realign our lives to who you say we are. We tune into the peace that comes with your presence this morning. And Father God, as we come around your word, God, I pray that what you want to be heard will be heard in the ears of your people, that my mouth will speak the wonders of your word this morning, that people will be inspired to press in deeper and to know you more. God, we thank you for the promise of your presence. And God, we thank you that you are not a man that you would lie, that your presence is here in this place. We honor your presence. We thank you, God, that you always show up. And we worship you for who you are. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats, church. I know, I'm like you. I would rather have these guys lead us in worship the whole service than listen to me. But you've got me for the next little while. Let's give these guys a round of applause. They come early, they work hard, they prepare behind the scenes. It doesn't just happen. Actually, nothing, <laughs> nothing that you see in church just happens. And we are so grateful for all the teams that come early to make things work, that prepare their hearts, ready to serve grumpy people, kind people. There's a whole spectrum right along the way. But God is on the move, hey? And Mr. Corden, we call him Mr. Corden because he's a PE teacher. He was just telling me this morning, and I was just thinking about it in worship, that he runs this, um, he's head of the sick form. I might be making that up. You can't hear me. Um, <laughs> head of the sick form at Blue Coat School, where a lot of our young people go, actually. And he was just telling me then that they've had to split the year 12 and the year 13, so like the lower sick students and the upper sick students for the Christian Union, because there's just too many of them. How amazing is that? That's incredible. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> There's 50-something year 12s that want to meet together for Christian Union and 30-odd of the um, year 13s. That is, that is incredible. That is unheard of. That is just an amazing time. And um, they're putting on a worship event on Thursday night, and some of our young people are part of that. And we're just so proud of you. And I'm saying now, go in and set the tone. Legacy sets the tone, yes? We tell them who we are, and we worship with passion and authenticity, and that's just going to be incredible. So keep those guys in your prayers um, this, this coming week. Are you all doing well? Are we sleepy? Are we excited? Are we glad it's still sunny in October? I'm glad it's still sunny. But if you have been in the past few weeks, you will know that we have been looking at the hallmarks of the early church. Acts 2, 42. We have went through it systematically, and it has been some excellent teaching. I just loved what Danny pulled out of um, the book Breaking of Bread last week and Judas's approach and those different things. I'd never heard some of those things before, and I was so grateful and brought back to a new place of devoted to that, devoted to fellowship, devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And they boomed. There wasn't this period of time where they became mature believers. These were the hallmarks, and then they went, wow, 3,000 people. People were added to the church daily as they um, promoted these principles and these practices within the early church. And I was thinking about the word devoted this week and how we've been talking about devoted, this devoted series, devoted to all these things. And I think when it comes to the subject of prayer, and you'll guess because I'm the last in the list of that verse, is this morning we're going to be talking about prayer. I think when we talk about devoted to prayer, we see it very much as that um, verb aspect of devoted to studying and discussion and depth and hard work. But actually, I was just reminded in all these things that we become devoted whenever we're working from a place of devotion. We have to have devotion to God to be able to devote ourselves to all of these things. We can find it, it, it becomes much, much easier to be devoted to prayer when we have a devotion for the one in who, to whom we pray. Mature believers are devoted to prayer from a place of devotion to Jesus. And here at Life Church, we need you all to be mature believers 
There's loads of things we put on, loads of courses, life groups, all the different things. But we want you to be committed to your own growth and your own personal relationship with Jesus. And when I was thinking about prayer, it took me a little while to come to where to settle on what I was going to talk about this morning because there is thousands and thousands and maybe millions, hundreds of thousands, millions of books written on prayer. There's lots of different things. And if you're coming this morning and you thought I was going to teach on specific practices of prayer, that's not what I'm going to do this morning. There are great books out there. Some great books that I read recently. Um, Timothy Keller does a great book on prayer. If you're a reader or even audible, uh, Tyler Stanton does one. Uh, I wrote one recently called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. There's the prayer course. You can look that up online on YouTube by 24-7 Prayer by Pete Gregg. That is so simple. It brings you systematically through the Lord's Prayer, and it is amazing. And there's so much out there. But this morning, what I really wanted to look at was a shift in our thinking when it comes to prayer. And it comes to us praying and what we, and how we can come in alignment with God's word and gain understanding in prayer. You see, prayer is so powerful. And I think I'm probably a good person to talk on this because I would never put myself in the category. I'm very normal when it comes to prayer. I'm not a, on my face on the floor all the time kind of person. I'm not a David's tent doing that. I want to be have more time for that. But I'm a busy mom who's got lots on and does lots of different things and serves the church in lots of different ways. But I do still love and make time for prayer, for conversing with God, for having that whole, those holy moments with God. I think we can sometimes forget the privilege that it is to access God through prayer. Tyler Stanton said this in his book. He says, prayer invites you to listen to God before speaking. I think it's going to come up on here, yes. To listen to God before speaking, to ask like a child in your old age, to scream your questions in an angry tirade, to undress yourself in vulnerable confession, and to be loved. Completely and totally loved, in spite of everything. And yet most people, even Bible-believing Christians, find life Find little life in prayer. Prayer is boring, obligatory, or confusing, or all of the above. Would you, who's going to be honest and say they've found themselves in those times, different times? Prayer can be boring. Yep, Jackie, thank you, you're honest. <laughs> prayer can, it can feel a bit, is it boring? Is it something I have to do? Am I doing it right? Have I got everything in the right order? Am I um, using the right words? All this stuff can be a little bit overwhelming. And sometimes I think it's a trick of the devil to separate and go, I'll just not bother. It's too overwhelming because we've overthought the whole thing. And I think through God's word this morning, my key objective is to inspire you back into a life of prayer. To call you back into a life of prayer. Not from a place of just when you're desperate though that's fine. Don't feel guilty going to God just when you're desperate. He wants to hear from you whenever. But not from a place when you're sick, from a place that he really wants to be in genuine communion and relationship with you. So the two key areas I want to look at this morning are, do we know who we are praying to? Who are you praying to when you pray? And what actually happens when we pray? So the first thing we're looking at this morning is we have to know who we are praying to. In my observations in life, I think prayer can be pretty instinctive. I don't think we always recognize that it is that. But actually, if you ask most people, they would say that they pray. They're maybe not sure who they pray to, what they're praying to. But there's something inside of us that longs for that deeper connection. Some people, there was a study done recently on people who don't believe in God, and they still say that at times they feel like they pray, which is really fascinating to me. I think our chief aim, we forget this as Christians, is to know God and become more like him. I think we, as Pentecostals, if you've never been here before, we're a Pentecostal church, we're quick to exclaim that our faith is a relationship and not a religion. We're very keen on that terminology, and it's not just about rules and regulations. But yet, when it comes to prayer, we treat it like a duty and not a privilege. 
Prayer in its simplest form is talking to God. Talking to the God of the heaven and the earth, the God who created you, the God who knows you by name, who knows what you're thinking before you even say it. But he wants to be in relationship with you. Do you really think about who you're praying to? Even as a Christian who does pray, I want to challenge you this morning. Do you actually think about who it is you're praying to and the power that he holds when you're saying your prayers? Or has it become habit and routine? Maybe you've been a bit desensitized to the power of prayer and disillusioned by it in your life. Maybe other people in your world, they get their prayers answered, but you never do. Or it feels like that. Maybe you've prayed for something and it didn't come to pass the way you hope it, hoped or expected it would. Maybe that relationship seemed like it got worse. Maybe that family member didn't get healed like you hoped that they would. And you question, what is the point in me even praying? I want to remind you this morning that prayer is not an opportunity for us to get what we want. Yes, God asks us to lay our requests before him. That is biblical. To lay our requests before, as David says in Psalm 5, I, lay, I wake up in the morning and I lay my requests before you. But it's not just about that. He's not a genie in the bottle where we get three wishes. I remember clearly when I was a youth pastor and we were in, and um, we went to Portsmouth on a youth conference. And Abby, you'd have been there with me <laughs> but there, I was walking with a group of lads and one of the lads had hurt his arm or his leg or something like that and he was struggling with this and it was a group of community kids who had no church background and they come away with us on this youth youth conference and it was an amazing time a lot of those kids had never left Bolton which you know is sad <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful place but you got to get out sometimes we got to the first service station, actually, and they were like, is this it? I was like, no, this is a service station, darling. But we, we'd brought these kids away, and I wanted to make prayer really normal to them. And I remember one of the kids, I can't remember if it was a, an arm or a leg or whatever, but he, he'd hurt himself, 12, 13-year-old boys. And as we're walking, eyes open, no spooky moment, I just went, shall we pray, lads? Let's pray. And we, I said, God, we pray that you will heal Jake's arm. And we know that you can, and we ask that you will today. And I'm about to say, in, and I take my breath, in Jesus' name. And as I take this deep breath, <laughs> this kid Jack went, Abracadabra. <laughs> <laughs> Before I said amen, he shouted, Abracadabra. And I was like, I couldn't stop myself laughing because it was just in that moment, prayer was a form of magic to him. And while we don't put it in that category of magic, there is something amazing about prayer. Yeah. There's a deep mystery in prayer, and all our prayers will not go answered. And listen to me, I am glad all my prayers have not been answered in the moment that I prayed them. In hindsight, we can look back and say, thank you, God, for rescuing me from that. I would be doing something totally different, married to somebody totally different, probably. <laughs> Somebody who didn't mind me getting packages delivered to the house. <laughs> you know what? This doesn't happen by accident. We're gonna <laughs> he loves it, really. No. <laughs> Where am I? Back to this. Abracadabra. There is beautiful mystery in prayer. It's divine communion with God. And usually, the biggest mystery of what is happening is happening inside of us. That's what a lot of prayer is about. It's not this list of requests where it's like a to-do list. It's not a Father Christmas list. It's not you sign it off, you know, Naomi Murphy, Bedworth. That's where I need my, all my parcels delivered to. God of the heaven and earth knows what you need. And he wants to be in relationship with you. Prayer is a conversation with the God of the universe, an invitation, if we go back to that quote, to be truly and deeply known and loved. It's incredible. And it's utterly necessary because we often need to reorder our priorities, just like what Danny was saying then when he was bringing us around the idea of giving. We need to reorder our priorities because we very quickly get messed up, and our first command is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we can demonstrate our devotion to God through prayer. 
through being devoted in prayer. I think we just so often get confused and we get this privilege and duty mixed up. Actually, it's an incredible privilege to come and pray on your own and as part of a corporate group, and we'll get onto that in a little minute. We no longer have to speak to God through priests, through different things. Jesus, death on the cross, obliterated all that for us. We can approach the throne room of heaven. Just let this sink in. I think this is what we get the disconnect of sometimes because we don't actually believe that we're worthy. Jesus makes us worthy. It's not that we're not worthy. We're made worthy through him. We can approach the throne room of heaven and speak to the God of heaven and earth because of our faith in Jesus Christ. That is an incredible privilege, but we don't think highly enough of ourselves or highly enough of Jesus to do that in a consistent way. And I want to inspire you today to say, God walked and talked in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3. <laughs> God walked and talked with Adam in the Garden of Eden. In the cool of the day, he walked and he talked. That's what he wants us to do. That's what he was restoring relationship with us. That is an incredible privilege and just a whole other world that we can be living in if we embrace that this morning. I love this verse. This is one of my all-time favorite verses. And I've got it on two translations here. It's in Psalm 116, verses 1 to 2. It says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. He bends down to listen. This is the Passion Translation. It said, I'm passionately in love with God because he listens to me. He hears my prayers and answers them. As long as I live, I'll keep praying to him for he stoops down to listen to my heart's cry. And I love that because there's a picture in that, that, you know, often through the Bible, we see this picture of God calling us up higher and his ways are higher. But in those moments of prayer, he does do that slowly, but he is such a kind, good, gracious God. He goes, okay, this is where you're at. Let me bend down to speak to you. Let me incline my ear toward you because I want to hear the prayers of your heart. I want to hear the honest, true, raw confession of your heart. He bends down to listen. He inclines his ear toward you. Not somebody else. Not, he's not too busy. He wants to listen to you. In the midst of the mystery and all the confusion, we need to know the God of the Bible in order to be able to trust that there is power and that there's purpose in our prayers. Otherwise, it does feel like a waste of time. It does feel futile. It does feel boring. It does feel obligatory, like it's just another thing we have to do. But when we know the God of the Bible, who is deeply invested in us, it changes our perspective. We can see this in the book of Job. And if you don't know the story of Job, go home and read it. It's really an interesting story. But Job is put through agonizing pain losing everything that he held dear and he cries out to God but for all his complaints Job never walks away from God or denies his, his existence this is the important bit he processes all of his pain and suffering through prayer he processes it it changes things the key question in the book of Job Job is is it possible for a man or woman to love God for himself alone so that there's fundamental contentment, regardless of my wish list, regardless of all my concerns, regardless of what I perceive to be a need in my life right now, is it possible for me to love God anyway? He's worthy of it anyway. By the end of the book, we see that the answer is yes, but only through prayer. Timothy Keller puts it like this, and I've got this quote for the screen, but it says, the more clearly Job saw who God was, the fuller his prayers became. Moving from a mere complaint, which is what we often go to God with, complaints, to confession, appeal, and praise. In the end, he broke through and was able to face anything in life. This new refinement and level of character came through the interaction of listening to God's revealed word and answering in prayer. The more true his knowledge of God, the more fruitful his prayers became and the more sweeping the change in his life. 
The power of our prayers then lies not primarily in our effort and striving or in any technique, which we can get hung up on those things, hey, but rather in our knowledge of God. Let me just read those last two sentences again. The more true his knowledge of God, the more fruitful his prayers became and the more sweeping the change in his life. The power of our prayers then lies not primarily in our effort and striving or in any technique, but rather in our knowledge of God. We need to know who we're praying to. We need to know this God of the Bible. So where do we start to know who God is? We read God's word. We get around God's word together. We learn God's word and see that he doesn't lie, that his word can be trusted, and that over and over again, God hears the prayers of the righteous. Proverbs 15, 29 says, he hears the prayers of the righteous. He Hebrews 6, 18 says, God is not a man that he should lie. When you get a right perspective of God and understand who you're praying to and realize he's devoted to you, he's loving and loyal towards you. These are the dictionary de definitions of devoted. He's zealous about you. The conversation of prayer with him becomes easier and sacred. It's not boring anymore. It's sacred. And our devotion to prayer and our conversation with him will naturally increase. We need to know who God is in order to be devoted to prayer. We need to remember that we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. And Jeremiah 33, verse 3, leads us nicely into what happens when we pray. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. God is going to tell me things, Naomi, no need to, really? God is going to speak to me. That's how a lot of you are thinking that this morning, aren't you? It's like, well, God will maybe speak to somebody else because they're holy, or God will speak to somebody else because they've got their family in order. God will speak to somebody else because they've got all their I's dotted and T's crossed. No, God wants to speak to you. And when we pray, when we call to him, he will answer us. And, and he will tell us things we do not know. What happens when we pray? I like to say it like this. Everything and nothing. Sometimes everything can pray, everything can change on the internal when we pray. And externally, it feels like nothing's changed all that much. God wants to do something in us. And if you ask anyone who's devoted to prayer, they know that prayer is much more about their relationship with God and God helping them see circumstances in a new way, giving them strength, giving them peace. Through prayer, God gives us peace. He gives us direction. He gives us insight and knowledge to deal with whatever we're facing. When Paul is writing those many letters in the New Testament, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, didn't he? And when he's writing those letters, he often starts them in the same way or in similar ways. And I'm just going to pull a little bit out of the opener from Ephesians. Paul often says encouraging statements like, I'm remembering that church, the church community and prayer, he's asking God that they'd have wisdom and revelation, that their eyes would be enlightened, that they would know hope. But what is the reason that Paul prays these things? And Ephesians 1 verse 17 spells it out for us. It says, 17 to 19, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul doesn't pray for circumstances to change. If you notice that, he, said, he doesn't pray that. He doesn't say, oh God, let that change and let that change and let that change. He prays that through it all, we might know God better. That through all the circumstances, we will be pushed into a place of prayer that makes we, means we know him in the depths of who we are. There's that expression, you know it in your knower. There's those things that nobody can ever take away from you because you know, you know. I've had situations in my life and I'm like, you can reason all you like, you can tell me all you think, all the science, all the whatever, but I know that I know that this doesn't just happen. There is a God of the universe. We know God better when we choose to spend time in prayer. We know him better when the eyes of our heart are enlightened. That's how he answers us. He helps us change. And 
Prayer is not a way to get more things from God, but a way to get more of God himself, more of his wisdom, his love and grace for any given situation. And I was thinking, you know, often we can hear these big prayer breakthrough moments, which do inspire us, but maybe aren't relatable. And I was thinking of a situation recently where I was just irritated with a relationship in my life. I was just like, why is that person just oppositional? Why is it that they won't just um, respond kindly to this? And I couldn't work it all out. And I, took, I was just getting more and more mad and frustrated. And I think it was, you know, I, I thought I was quite righteous because they were the basic human qualities that we should be working towards of kindness and being thoughtful and caring and all that stuff. And I was being all those things and it wasn't being reciprocated. And I brought it to God. And I was like, God, help me understand. And God just started to give me grace and give me patience and remind me of a couple of things that that person's been through that maybe means that the walls are up a little bit. There's a barrier around that person's heart. I just thought, you know what? God, thank you for your grace. Thank you that in this situation, we can protect our unity because you will enlighten the eyes of my heart. He doesn't tell us other people's secrets necessarily. It just helps us understand. Hold on, Naomi. Did you need grace? Did you need compassion? What about when you went through something like that? Oh, yeah. God, thank you for your kindness to me in that situation. I'm going to draw on your kindness, on your grace, and I'm going to see it through that lens. It's a really small situation, but maybe if you just bring that troubled child to the Lord in prayer. Maybe if you bring that difficult work colleague, that difficult boss to the Lord in prayer, maybe, just maybe, he will enlighten the eyes of your heart to see something that you wouldn't have seen on your own. He promises to do that through his word, to help us solve great mysteries. The coming like Christ is supposed to be the path that I'm on. And you know, it's not just when we pray individually, while that should be primary important. There's so much power when we pray collectively. Praying in community is really significant. Corporate prayer is both powerful and essential. And if you're new to this church or you're not sure if you're invited, you are invited. 7.30 a.m. boiler room on a Friday morning. You are invited. You don't need to know all the right words to say. You don't need to be schooled in Christianese. You are invited to pray as part of this family corporately. And I was just looking into and formulating a list of some of the things that happen. And this isn't an extensive list. But again, I'm hoping it will inspire you to pray collectively. Praying in community is both powerful and essential. Let me tell you some of the benefits for us as a church. First thing that it can do, or one thing it can do, is it unifies the body of Christ. Romans 15 verse 6 talks about us glorifying God with one mind and one voice. As we pray together, our hearts are more deeply knit with God's heart and with each other. We're given a glimpse of the unity that we'll enjoy when we get to heaven. Glorious day that will be. Corporate prayer connects us around a common purpose and there's this solidarity that you wouldn't get in another setting. We're not all pulling in our own direction, drawn to our own wish list or hobby horse, different things. It brings us around common purposes. We're less selfish. We're more focused on God's will and purpose for our lives and the lives of others. It's really great to come and pray together and unify the body together. The second thing I think it can do is it encourages those who participate. You see, we gather to strengthen other people in, in that circle. Do you know, when we get around, our individual hearts are encouraged. Life can often take it out of us. But other people's faith is strengthened by remembering his grace and his goodness. Sometimes people can't even bring the words to say. And you standing next to them reminds them of a good God who is for them. The Holy Spirit brings them to reassurance and comfort through the prayers of others. That's why we're told to not forsake meeting together in Hebrews 10 verse 25. Where it also gives us an opportunity to carry one another's burdens. Galatians 1 verse 6, we're 
we're asked to carry. That's how we do it. We pray. We can't do much else a lot of the time. There's often very little we can do for other people's circumstances. There's, there's yes, there's immediate needs we can meet. But just to know that somebody's standing with you in prayer changes things. Corporate prayer disciples believers in prayer. People can learn from other people through how to pray. That's how I've learned how to pray a lot of the time over the years. We learn by hearing and repetition and understanding how we can even, how we can come to pray. People new to faith will learn prayer techniques such as praying scripture, listening in silence for God's response, interceding on the behalf, on the behalf of others, and methods of praising God and worshiping him as well. In essence, we can be discipled through our prayer, corporate prayer together. It can teach us and help us to grow and build us up in a different way. Another thing corporate prayer does, it strengthens weakened faith. When our faith is fragile and doubt creeps in, corporate prayer and worship can strengthen us to lean in on the faith of others. John wrote in 1 John 5 about the confidence that if we ask in prayer, God hears us and answers. But sometimes you need somebody next to you. We're all a bit more confident if we're walking into the room with somebody else, aren't we? That's why when we invite somebody to church, we say, I'll meet you at the door. When you're going somewhere, you say, I'll meet you there, because it increases your confidence to go into that situation. When we pray with other believers and experience God moving, it strengthens our heart to wait on, the, on him. And whenever our prayers are unanswered for a long time, coming together and praying together does something to our hearts. It's incredible. We've got an event in a couple of weeks, 24th of October, and it's praying for prodigals. And some of you know Pat's heart to just really press in and believe for prodigals who are not in the house to be found in the house again. As people come together with that unity, like-mindedness, stories of faith, stories of hope, and stories of pain and stories of disappointment, God does something in the mix of that as we pray together, as we bring it to him. Corporate prayer creates a sense of expectancy. I'm ready to reference Psalm 5. David wrote, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. As believers continue to regularly gather for intentional times of corporate prayer, a sense of anticipation rises that you just don't get on your own. Well, unlikely that you get it on your own. There's something about being in that buzz of other people, about being around other people, about expecting God can show up, he will show up, he wants to show up in this situation. Many people have lost their sense of hope. And it's possible that hope can be rekindled as we gather together and pray to seek the face of God. Whether it's in little prayer duos or triplets, whether it's in great big massive prayer gatherings, as we seek the face of God together, we see unity grow, experience encouragement firsthand, strengthen our collective faith, all these things, facilitate repentance and create a sense of expectant hope. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of that. I want my prayer life to be in line with that. You are welcome to be at any prayer gathering that we put on here at this church, but make your own prayer triplets, make your own time when you can pray together and strengthen one another, whether it's on faith, there's so many easy ways to do it, yeah, we don't need to get up and meet each other at six o'clock anymore, we can do it on Zoom, we can do it on FaceTime, we can connect with one another and pray with one another. So just as I'm wrapping up this morning, I'm, the band will be coming back up now, I just want to ask you these few questions, am I devoted to to prayer. Ask yourself these questions. Is it a central theme of my life? Do I prioritize it or do I need to reorder some of my priorities? Do I believe that the God of heaven bends down and listens to what I have to say? Do I deeply believe that? Because how you act determines what is determined by what you believe. And if you don't believe God's listening, your prayer life is probably difficult because you think it, you're thinking, what's the point? Do I treat prayer and approach God like he's a genie in a bottle? Father Christmas, mystical characters, the God of the universe. Do I give him the honor that he deserves? Is God challenging me to raise my expectancy in my prayer life? 
to move from a posture of what I can get to a posture of who can I get more of? Can I get more of you, God? There's always more to be known in God. Our prayers matter because we find out more about who we are as we find out more about the God who created us. We were always meant to reflect him and his glory. And we were always meant to be walking and talking with him. That was our normal. And the fall separated us from that. But Jesus did a beautiful work to reconcile us back to God. But sometimes we miss these key aspects that we could be grasping at, that we could be clinging to, because we just don't quite understand that it was for you and it was for me, me personally. Jeremiah 29, 13 tells us that those who seek him with all of their hearts will find him. All of our hearts. That's the key bit. All of our hearts. We don't give all of our hearts sometimes, church. I know I struggle sometimes. All my focus, all my attention in that moment. It's not always easy. But we find him. He promises us in his word that we will find him. And as the band lead us in this next song, just for the first verse and chorus or whatever feels the most natural in this moment, just ask God to speak to you again. What have I stopped speaking to God about? What have I thought he's not interested in because it wasn't on my time scale? Choose to bring God back into that conversation. I've met Christians who say I stopped praying about it because I was just so disappointed. I said I couldn't do it anymore because it wasn't it wasn't happening. It wasn't making any difference. The God of the universe cares about you and his timing is perfect. What have you given up all hope on? Speak to him about it this morning in prayer. What insecurities do you have about prayer? That you're not getting it right, that you're not good enough, that I can't pray out loud. It's just a conversation with God. Remember that the power of our prayers lies not in the one who prays, but in the one that we pray to. And we're going to sing about the power that is in the name of Jesus. And just pray in your own heart that you will know God, that we will all know him more deeply, that we will allow him to shape us and to mold us like the potter shapes the clay, that we will be fully in his hands. Let's just meditate on that these next few minutes and then we'll worship together. There's a faith that stands in fire, sends Goliath to his knees. I've seen his prey, the rock of shadow, of time. As the power of your wisdom measure. Same of old, the grave is all. 
Father, we thank you this morning that our prayers are prayed on an empty grave. The cross couldn't hold Jesus. The grave couldn't contain Jesus. But Jesus is alive, he's present, he's active, and he is able. He's able to do immeasurably more than we can ask, think, or imagine because there is power in the name of Jesus. We thank you that mountains are moved because of the power there is in the name of Jesus. We thank you that seas can be parted because of the power in your name. We thank you that dead things can be brought to life because of the power in your name. Sick things can be made well because of the power there is in your name. May we never lose the wonder and the awe that we ought to possess whenever we consider the name of Jesus. We thank you that no prayer is futile. But every prayer makes a difference. But Father, we thank you for that reminder this morning. The prayer is not just about what you do for us. But prayer is about what you want to do within us. Father, help us learn, recognize, realize that as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. You give us the gift of your presence. You help us know your ways, your character, your heart, and your nature in ever-increasing measure. So, Father, I pray that as your people, we will truly be devoted to prayer. Not because of what we might get, but because of who we have the privilege of knowing in a deeper and more tangible way. Father, thank you that you've made a way for us to know you. Thank you for the gift, the vehicle, the vessel and the privilege of prayer. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do on the other side of prayers that have even been prayed this morning that you will answer in your perfect way and in your perfect timing. In Jesus' precious and powerful name, all God's people said, Amen. all God's people said, Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Naomi, for that word. Let's just show our appreciation to the word of God being shared so powerfully to us today. A couple of things just to mention. You can grab your seats. You can grab your seats. As Naomi said, we have boiler room every Friday uh, at the moment. That's a good, healthy, small company of people, and that's okay because how many people know that the greatest revivals around the world were often started by a small collection of praying people? But as Naomi said, that invitation is open to you. 7.30 to 8.30, it's an hour of power. I realize if you're working, it might be a challenge, but some of you could maybe be there, and we'd love to see more people come along to that. Just a reminder that next Sunday, as we said, is our expansion offering. Take one of these flyers at the door if you haven't already received one. It'll just give you all the practical information to help you get prepared for Super Sunday next weekend. When God's going to move, we believe, in power and multiply what we sacrifice and sow into his vision for this place. In the evening as well, we've got special guest Noel Robinson, who'll be joining us in our service in the morning, but also doing a brilliant worship concert in the evening. We're going to have a praise party together. So book in for that. It's a free event. We'll be taking an offering on the evening, but it's a free event. Come along, bring your friends, bring your family, bring your neighbors, bring your cat, bring your dog, your rabbit, your guinea pig, whatever. Just come along and be there for that evening. Don't bring those animals, actually. Please don't bring those animals. Don't like them. Uh, Jack, come and tell us really briefly, really quickly about something coming up for the men in the room. Welcome, Jack. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, men, I am here to speak to you. We have our life men's blokes barbecue and rugby um, coming up on the 28th of October. We're just gathering to watch the Rugby World Cup final. Um, if you are not into rugby, don't come. No, I'm j joking, I'm joking. Um, if you are not into rugby, please, please come. We want to just build community as um, a group of men. We want to meet you. We'll have some extra things for those that maybe don't engage in uh, rugby because, you know, it's, we just want you to be here. Um, so, just some details for you. It is £8 per person, and that covers you get a burger or you get a sausage and soft drinks. Oh, very exciting. Um, 
And if you do have any dietary requirements, please do let us know. But the deadline for sign up is the 23rd of October. Okay, so make sure you're signed up then. Otherwise, you'll come in and you might not get any food. Uh, which, as men, we all know, that's what we love. That's the way to our hearts. So please do come. We want you there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jack. And finally, just to let you know that one of our missions partners, Samaritan's Purse, they are building, or perhaps have built, their headquarters just nearby in Coventry, and they've got an open day coming up. I believe we've got the slide with all the details there. And there are jobs available. There's a bit of a job fair if you're looking for work and would like to work for a brilliant Christian organization, Samaritan's Purse could be the one for you. So have a look at the details, check the website, and uh, make your way through to Cov and hear all about their brilliant mission and ministry. We're going to stand together as we go. If you need to leave, that's fine. I realize the time is already gone. But I just want to declare the power there is in the name of Jesus one final time, especially ahead of next weekend. We need the power of Jesus to come through on our behalf miraculously next week and into our futures. Come on, let's stay standing and let's just worship him one final time. Every time. 
call upon your name at any time, any place, in any way, Lord, and you answer. Whether that is in the moment, or whether it is later on, you always answer. It may not be what we expect you to answer, but it is an answer, Lord. You are God who speaks back. We speak to you and you speak back. We have conversations with you. Thank you that you are always speaking. Help us have a listening ear. Help us just wait on your presence and be able to communicate with you, Lord. Give us a heart for prayer. Give us a heart that seeks you out. Jesus, thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are with us always, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Thank you, Jesus, that we find life in you. That we find life in you.